Hey everyone, this is Dr. Fox. Thank you all for your continued support, and thank you to my Podbean patrons for helping me to continue CRP and Central's podcast. For more information about our mission, please contact us today at info at crpaynet.com for details. The results are in. Your diagnosis is a difficult one to deliver. However, I have good news. I found a clinical trial that may help, and I believe that you may be qualified to participate. Thank you, doctor. What would I have to do to enroll in this trial? Well, I'll refer you to my colleague who is an investigator. His team will explain to you the trial and help you through participation. They will ask you to sign consent papers, give you the medicine, ask you questions, and collect data. It is okay to leave the trial at any time, and nobody will be mad at you. That means I'd have to leave your office and go to a different position to participate. Mm, I need to think about this. I understand. Please take your time. We can follow up in two weeks. Two weeks later. Welcome back. Have you considered the clinical trial? There's a chance it can really help your diagnosis. I can't do it, doctor. I am autistic and I am not comfortable leaving you. I'd rather stay with you. I understand and I wish there was more I could do to help. We'll do all we can right here in my office. Autistic patients require customized care, and their physicians are so much more than trusted health care providers. Denying our autistic community members access to trials from the comfort of their local physician's offices not only prevents access to potentially life-saving options, but it also excludes an entire population of individuals who could be contributing substantially to the clinical trial enrollments we desperately need to translate our research. If we want want to fully embrace diversity in our industry, we must consider the needs of our patients. If we can develop these logistics, we will strengthen not only our community, but also strengthen the power of our entire industry. Welcome to CRPN Central, the official podcast of the Clinical Research Payment Network. I'm your host, Dr. Daniel Fox. CRPN Central discusses the real issues with our clinical research industry to explore and identify mutually beneficial solutions for all of our stakeholders. We can make the best possible medications, and they will stay on our shelves unless we accommodate the patients who need them. Asking a patient to leave their trusted physician and to take health risks to test new medications simply doesn't make sense. Asking an autistic patient to leave the physician they chose to see for their care is not only challenging, but it's torture. How can we construct a clinical research infrastructure that can accommodate the needs of the same patients we strive to serve? April is Autism Awareness Month, and to observe it, today's episode is dedicated to exploring autism accommodations in current clinical research models. Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, is a developmental disability caused by differences in the brain. Autistic individuals often have problems with social communication and interaction. They are commonly restricted to repetitive behaviors or interests, and they may also have different ways of learning moving, or paying attention. Autistic patients are not immune to sickness and healthcare complications, and they are often prone to comorbidities such as epilepsy, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and so many others. These patients need our help, and research could benefit greatly if we accommodated ways to offer them research opportunities. Today, we will discuss autism and clinical research first with an autistic adult caretaker who has experienced firsthand clinical trials with her autistic loved one. Then we will have a conversation with a provider who has decades of experience working with autistic students in educational settings. To maintain valid comparisons, both interviews will utilize the same questions, and my guests did not have the questions before the interviews. After our discussions, we will follow up to identify mutually identifiable challenges and potential solutions to fully explore the neurodiverse potentials for fast, efficient, quality, and importantly, accommodating clinical research within the 
autistic community. Our first guest cares for her son and is by far the sweetest and most giving human being that I know. Mrs. Becky Moore served for years helping nonprofit organizations raise funds for local charities and ministries. She has a strong relationship throughout her community and she is known as the mother who never quits. Her son, Jake, is autistic and required Becky to stay home to help care for his medical and living needs. Jake absolutely loves to peel potatoes and as a result, Becky founded a company to make dog treats that are highly nutritious and healthy morsels, originally for emaciated dogs at animal shelters. Becky has journeyed through numerous clinical trials with Jake and understands fully what it takes to help him through a study's requirements. Please welcome with me, Mrs. Becky Moore. Becky Moore, thank you so much for joining CRP and Central today. My pleasure. It's so nice to have you. Becky, I've known you for years now, and every time I talk to you, I become more and more impressed with your journey. Would you be willing to introduce yourself to the audience? Absolutely. My name is Becky Moore. I have a family of five. My husband and I have three children. Our oldest is Jacob, age 22, and he has autism, seizure disorder, and a multitude of other diagnoses. We live in central Illinois, and we just have been on a journey of family and healthcare and life and... <laughs> Lots and lots and lots of doctor's appointments and therapy appointments and all that good stuff. Wow. Still on that journey and trying to just really raise all three of our children in the same way. Trying to raise them all to be as independent as possible. Try to raise them to be good citizens, good helpers, good people, good manners, no matter what their issues or non-issues are. So it's just a little more challenging when you have a different mindset and different capabilities. So you start seeking what your children's strengths are and trying to bring those out. So that's kind of wow. where we are a little bit in our life right now. And Becky, I know you work really hard to empower your children to be independent and to be strong right. and to be mm -hmm. part of the community. I think you've yeah. even gone as far as to help Jake with a company. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. After Jake graduated in May of this year, this last year rather, I had been thinking for a long time before that, like, hey, when Jake graduates, what's he going to do? I knew that he had a skill set enough to have a job and keep a job somewhere. And he's told us since he was in third grade, every time you'd ask him, what do you want to be when you grow up, Jacob? He'd say, I want to be a custodian like Greg and Johnny, because he worked with two custodians at Glenwood Intermediate School since his third grade. And even when he went to the middle school and the high school, they bust him over to help do his job because he loved it and it was very fulfilling. And wow. they created an organic vocational training program program for him and he, he loved it and still loves it. And when he graduated, the school district actually hired him for a union position, paid position for three hours a night, five days a week as a sub custodian. So he's been working Monday through Friday in the evenings from four to 7 p.m. But I just knew that wasn't going to be enough for him because he's just a person who loves to be busy all the time. If he has too much downtime, he gets kind of antsy and bored and just a little agitated. He really wants wants to have a job to do. And that's just in him. I thought, what else is Jake going to do? And kind of at the end of COVID, we'd started helping some of our friends who were doing dog rescue. And these dogs were coming in and they were very abused and neglected and emaciated, just skin and bones. And Jake and I loved to bake and cook together. And so we did a little project where we baked and created some high fat, high protein dog treats for these dogs to try to kind of put some weight on them fast in a healthy way. And so my friend was like, oh, these are great. Our dogs love them. They're gaining weight. They're doing well. They're getting so healthy. I should really sell treats. Our dogs love these. <laughs> oh, wow. Then we just, another yeah. thing that just kind of organically began. We started Big mm -hmm. Jake's Dog Treats. And so now we sell in five different stores in the community and people order from us online. They call an order, email an order, text an order, and he's having a blast with it. So that's what he was wow. doing this morning. He was doing pork twists and <laughs> sweet potato crust. You know, it's small. It's very small, but it's flourishing. And people love that Jake is doing this. And Jake also loves very much to be in community. He always has. It sounds like Jake is becoming a very inspirational contributor to society. He loves doing it. He's so cute and happy and joyful when he does it. He'll be making chicken twists and he'll be laughing and giggling the whole time. And he'll say, he's making these chicken twists. It's Big Jake's dog treats. Big Jake's dog treats, mama. He's making these chicken twists for these dogs. And he's just... 
Gosh. He's just having a good time. Putting all the sweet potatoes on the trays, he'll say, it's like a puzzle mama. It's like a puzzle mama. Putting them on the <laughs> tray like a puzzle. And I say, yeah, it is. You got to put them all together like a puzzle, put them together real closely. And he's learning all these things. Every day we always learn something new, right? In anything we do. But we're always mm-hmm. learning ways to do things more efficiently, quicker or prettier. And so we're having a lot of fun with it. I don't think I could have asked for a better segue into this podcast. I asked you on to CRPN to discuss autism in clinical research, specifically autism friendly environments that are designed to accommodate autistic patients. Do you have experience enrolling autistic participants into clinical research? Yes. When we were at Mayo Clinic recently in December, they had a couple of studies and we participated in one. It was a DNA test. Then when we were there, we were at Mayo Clinic in, I believe, 2009, and we did a couple of studies for them. Intermittently, we've done a few studies for other health research providers. I just always have felt like, hey, if there's something that we can do and it's just a tiny blood test or a nose swab or a mouth swab, and we can send that in and research can help somebody else, then God bless it. Just so everyone knows, you said Mayo Clinic. How far away is Mayo Clinic from your residence? Um, I think it was about a nine hour drive. If I remember, it might have been eight or eight or nine well, hours. Nine hours one way? One way? Yeah. Yeah. We've been there twice. Have you ever been offered research in Illinois? It's been a long time ago. I think there may have been a couple times in Illinois ago, and I don't even remember the exact organizations. Not as of recent, not as of the last 10, 15 years. As someone who has enrolled an autistic participant in a clinical trial, what do you perceive are the unfavorable conditions or challenges in clinical trials for an autistic participant? Well, for one thing, sometimes they don't understand what is going on. Jacob may go in for a blood test, but he really doesn't comprehend why. He trusts me as his mom and his legal guardian that we're doing the right thing. And of course, I would never do anything to put him in any harm or through any pain or unnecessary treatment. There have been times in his life I'm like, hey, enough's enough. We're done with this. We're <laughs> you go to a geneticist and a geneticist can test for 10,000 things and they can just keep testing and testing and testing. Sometimes you just have to say like, this is enough. We're good. We aren't really getting any further with the situation. But I feel like that is one of the challenges is that they may not understand, like my son, what they're participating in. And then there are also some tests, like there was one at Mayo Clinic, a gentleman came in, a clinician, and he asked us if we would like to participate in this one study for seizure disorder. And it was a study where he would take home some little piece of equipment, and it was a camera for his room, and the camera would track his brain activity overnight. And they were testing for like looking for seizure activity in the nighttime hours. And I thought that would be an incredible opportunity to do that, because we did not know that Jacob was having seizure seizure activity all night long. He looked like a sleeping angel and his brain was firing off seizure activity all night long. So I was like, yeah, I'd love to participate in that for Jacob. That would be not intrusive at all. It'd be in his own home, in his own room. There's no privacy issue here. They're just going to see his head. But in this particular study, a legal guardian could not just agree to this. The actual individual had to have the comprehension of what they were participating in and Jacob did not. So therefore, we didn't qualify to participate in that study. And I thought that's kind of a bummer because although I understand and respect that because we're rule followers, it's unfortunate because he would have been a perfect candidate Mm -hmm. for that study. But since he didn't actually comprehend it, he literally could not participate. They're on the right track in trying to find ways that we can do some things in home that we do not have to have a hospitalization for, that we do not have to have an ER visit for, or an entire admission to an epilepsy monitoring unit for four to six days. These are great alternatives to be able to check out what's going inside your brain when you're at home in the comfort of your own home while you're relaxed, nobody's poking at you, you're, you know, you're comfortable, you're not scared, you're not nervous for the individual with autism or seizure disorder to be able to determine some of these things and to help other people. One of the very standardized expectation or understanding of autism is structure and routine. I had just thought that maybe it was kind of a barrier to access clinical research if autistic 
patients were told that they'd have to leave the comfort of their doctor's office to try to go talk to another doctor to be part of research. Do you okay. feel as though that is a barrier or is that just like a conception? No, I agree with that. Structure is very important, really, for all of us. I and mean, if you think about it, we all like to know what's expected. None of us want to be blindsided by anything. But for individuals with autism, most of them, it's very important to have that structure, to have the understanding of what's coming next so they're not thrown off. Because when we get thrown off, we get upset and that's everybody. So having to go from one doctor to another doctor or one clinic to another clinic, it gets complicated in so many ways because I guess it just brings a lot of anxiety for the individual. And a long time ago, I got a really good piece of advice from a doctor when Jake was age six. It was the best piece of advice ever and I've never forgotten it and I've always tried to do this. But she said, hey, Becky, you know, Jacob has so much anxiety. So many of our kids have so many anxiety going to the doctor alone because they don't know what's going to happen. Are they going to have a blood draw? Are they going to have this or that happen? And it's scary for them. So she said, you know, bring a backpack for Jacob everywhere you go, especially when you go to doctor's appointments or therapy appointments with him or somewhere where you think he'll be nervous or antsy and have a bunch of things packed in there that he likes to do. Little fidget things, snacks, coloring pages if he likes to color, whatever he likes to do, shove it in that backpack. Many different things to keep him busy and keep his mind off what's going on. So when we're in a doctor's office or we're at a study or we're somewhere, if we're waiting for an hour and that anxiety is building up, there's no reason to let that anxiety build up. You get that backpack out and try to divert their anxiety just to get them to calm down and relax. It's almost like you're creating your own structure and your own structure bubble. So wherever you're going somewhere that's unfamiliar, Mm -hmm. you have that as a way to lean on that you know what's in that backpack and you kind of have an understanding of what you can do in the time that you're waiting. Correct. Exactly. Instead of having a meltdown in a lobby and everybody's looking at you, (laughs) staring at you and your child's freaking out and you're just like, oh, this is horrible. You know, it really does take the anxiety off all around. And I think for families too, it's difficult when you are at different clinics. All these clinics, they all have different systems. They're not all in the same system. Mm -hmm. The communication among clinics or physicians of different areas is very challenging to get records transferred over and make sure they get to the right spot and make sure they get there timely. And if one doctor wants a lab ordered and it's at a different clinic, you've got to make sure as the consumer that the lab has received the order, the order's there, you don't show up and there isn't an order because all those things are very confusing then for your child or your adult child and stressful. It's like, well, what are we doing here? You drug me into this clinic to do this thing and then we're leaving. What is going on? So I think that's a challenge as well when you have multiple providers and at different clinics or different offices. Now, you know, Becky, I started my own clinical site right here in Illinois Mm -hmm. and I call it Land of Lincoln Clinical Research. Mm -hmm. And one of my initiatives is to create an autism friendly clinical research environment. I want to make it very easy and comfortable for autistic patients to become autistic participants in clinical research. I think that they have a lot that they can contribute to our industry. And I also think that we have a lot that we can contribute to help them to live better lives. I'm trying to bring to autistic patients the clinical trials so that all they have to do is go to their doctor's office that they are familiar with and participate in the trials through different logistics and through different telemedicine opportunities and things like that, where my site works directly with that physician so Mm -hmm. that we can offer a seamless experience for that autistic patient. My theory was that that could reduce the anxiety because they wouldn't have to go see someone new. They could go with their routine. Mm -hmm. And my guess is those physicians that work with those autistic patients, they know exactly how to work with them. They Mm -hmm. know how to care for that patient. And if we Mm -hmm. can deliver different trial opportunities to them, it could help. How do you think we can resolve these operational barriers to help our clinical trials become more autism friendly? I like the idea of having them go to their own doctor's office because they are familiar with that. And a lot of the doctor's offices are have very like friendly doctor rooms at this point. I don't know how many things can be done from home if possible. And maybe that's not even possible. To me, that'd be the most ideal situation. But if there are certain protocols or certain things that need to happen for a clinical study that they do have to go to a doctor's office, that would be great to have them either go to their office or to have them all go to one central location that is very soothing. You hear a lot about comfort rooms. 
events, you know, when you have autistic events or events for people with autism. Mm -hmm. I think we call them sensory rooms. Yeah, sensory rooms. Exactly. Sensory room. Uh, But if there was one place that would offer a room to have like a sensory room where some of these um, clinical trials could take place, to me, that would be the most ideal thing because also then they wouldn't have the anxiety of going to a doctor's office, even if it was their own doctor's office. They would just be going to this kind of cool place that had maybe, I'm not saying video games, just some cool things to do there. Maybe they have different things in a circuit or activities that are conducive for our kids that would be kind of a cool, fun place to go that's not too exhilarating, too overwhelming, overstimulating, that that clinical trial or that study could be conducted. Whether they have to answer questions or have a blood test or whatever the situation is, to me, that would be like one of the most ideal things possible. So challenge Mm -hmm. might be finding an organization to offer a room that would provide that or allow that. But you'd have to have the medical people to be set up to go there or do that at that location. Oh, and it's very possible that a lot of our autism specialists who see these patients have these rooms in place at their clinics. Is that, Mm -hmm, do they have that? So Mm -hmm. that could be another way that we could approach that. Do you think that if we were to resolve these operational barriers, whether it's the unfamiliarity, the records, the distance, you wouldn't have to travel nine hours. Do you think that our autistic patient population would have any interest in participating in clinical research? I mean, I think they would. And I think their parents would have that interest with them. The thing that I always most concerned about is making sure that Jacob is well taken care as possible, that he is not scared of what we are doing, that he doesn't have any high anxiety about what we're doing. Because if he does, I'm out. He's not a lab rat. So of course, you know, we don't want them to be lab rats either. We want to learn about autism. We want to learn about what causes or what can help it or how we could do things better for people with autism, mentally, emotionally, physically. But sometimes like just enough is enough. And if you feel like they've been kind of poked, prodded enough, it's like, oh, we're done with this for a while. But I think if there are ways that we can learn about how we can help each other with autistic issues neurologically, biologically, physically, if we can do some solid research that would actually be helpful to the autistic population and that can be proven to the autistic population and to their parents, their caregivers, their guardians, then it is worthwhile. If we were to reduce these barriers and offer access to clinical research, there's far more trials out there than just to analyze autism. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there are certain comorbidities or indications that are in the autistic community that could benefit from clinical research? Oh, completely. Absolutely. It's kind of sad because early on when we learned Jacob had autism, we're like, oh, okay, Jacob has autism. All right, let's figure this out. What is it? What do we learn about it? What do we know about it? How do we treat this? How do we handle this? What does Jacob need? He needs therapy. Oh, he needs speech therapy, OT, occupational therapy. He might need ABA therapy. He's had all those things and they've been all very helpful for him throughout his life at different stages. And I think that there's such comorbidity with autism. You think your child just has autism and then the years go by and these little things creep in. They sneak in. (laughs) Oh, hey, you know, at school, I think your son's having seizures. I'm like, what? Seizures? Are you kidding me? I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, he does this thing with his eyes. And I said, oh, I thought that was like kind of an autistic tick that he had going on because he had little ticks that he would do. No, I think that's seizure activity. And so we get him into the doctor and lo and behold, he's got seizure disorder. So (laughs) these little things come at you. Non-alcoholic fatty liver syndrome, prosephaly, high blood pressure, chronic sleep apnea. These things just creep in when someone has a neurological issue like autism. They can just have autism or they can have like about 10 or 15 other things. Unfortunately, my son is one of those young men who have like 10 or 15 other things. He literally has about 10 different specialists he gets to visit every year. How fun. And I always Some thought people, diabetes and obesity, I always heard that those two were prevalent in uh, autism. Jake doesn't have diabetes yet, I say. <laughs> I hope he never gets it. And yeah, he has the obesity card, but he also has no metabolism. So it's a double whammy. He also has bipolar disorder as well. So bipolar and autism go hand in hand and seizure disorder go hand in hand. I haven't really heard that diabetes goes hand in hand with autism. I've never heard that. But definitely seizure disorder 
and OCD, which autism is OCD at its finest definition, but autism, OCD, seizure disorder, and bipolar are very related. The comorbidity is amazing with autism. It's, it's very sad. And you get this diagnosis of autism and you think, well, that stinks and kind of does stink for that person in, in certain ways. It can be a gift. It can be a curse. It can be both, a little bit of both. Um, mm-hmm. Jacob's so amazing. He's got autism, but it definitely does not define find this young man. I've met Jacob as well. It's been an honor to meet Jacob. He is truly an inspiration. Mm -hmm. And what he does, we see that often in our autism community. Yeah. And I really do believe that we as a society should be doing everything we can to break down these clinical research barriers and to offer access to clinical research, accommodate our autistic community. If I were to give you the microphone and you wanted to tell everyone how you felt about trying to get our autistic community access to clinical research, what would you tell them? It is definitely going to be a challenge to do that, but it's definitely possible. If we have a goal, if we have strategies that can work toward achieving that goal, it's possible. We know there are kind, loving physicians in our community, and I think that it's definitely possible to find a space, whether it's in a doctor's office or elsewhere, to do that, to find an area where you can combine a clinical study, you know, for an individual with autism that may be sensitive to light or sound or noise or whatever it is, you know, to kind of soothe those anxieties and provide a space of comfort for them to have a very high quality clinical study to actually learn something for the autism community to benefit the autism community. Clinical research is very structured. Protocols follow rules. It is very possible that our autistic participants would be the most compliant participants in the study. Correct. Uh, Becky, thank you for coming on to CRPN Central. It was a true honor to have you here, and I look forward to sharing your story with our community. Oh, my pleasure, Daniel. We love what you're doing. We love your heart and enthusiasm for the autism community. Oh, thank you so much. All right, we'll talk to you later. Okay, have an awesome day. All right, bye. Bye Bye-bye. This episode of CRPN Central is brought to you by Save Our Sites. Save Our Sites is founded by clinical site administrators. It's four sites, and we want to make sure that we can reduce every possible barrier for our clinical site administrators to come to a conference, talk about what they need, and get something done. February 2nd, 2024, Tucson, Arizona. Please consider registering. For more information, go to saveoursites.com. Our next guest has worked with our autistic community in formal educational settings for over 20 years. Jonathan Zemsky is a certified occupational therapist who has worked in educational public and private settings to ensure our generations have everything they need to succeed. John is particularly interested in helping the autistic population, and he has served with them for many decades. Jonathan has a particular intuition into the needs of our autistic community and society, and I am so very thankful for the time that he is taking to speak with us today. Please welcome with me, Mr. Jonathan Zemsky. Jonathan Zemsky, thank you for coming to CRPN Central today. Thank you so much for having me, Daniel. It's really good to have you. Jonathan, would you give us a brief introduction? Sure. My name is Jonathan Zemsky. I am a certified occupational therapist and have been working in the school systems throughout the country for about 23 years now. And I consider myself an autism specialist based on the fact that I've dedicated a lot of my career to assisting families. Jonathan, I have had the opportunity of collaborating with with you for years now. And I can tell you that from a first person perspective, you have done a lot for our autism community. And I know for a fact that you are very dedicated to their well being. Thank you so much for saying that. It really comes from my heart, probably more than my brain at times. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that. My pleasure. Jonathan, today we're going to talk about clinical trials for the autistic population. Specifically, we want to try to talk about how we 
can make clinical trials more autism friendly. And to do that, I have a list of questions to ask you. I've asked another interviewee the same questions, and we're going to compare the results. What a wonderfully uh, didactic approach to helping the autistic community. I think that's amazing. You are an occupational therapist, and we have talked about clinical trials before. How much do you know about the process of clinical research? I would say I'm somewhere in the um, intermediate understanding from the allied health perspective. Generally speaking, I have a decent understanding of the process, but I wouldn't say I would be an expert going through step by step. Let's just consider this briefly. So let's say that you are an autistic patient and you're suffering from something, something that clinical research could help. Let's say that you go to your doctor's office and your doctor says, well, you have this problem, this ailment, and there's nothing I can do for you. However, I do have a colleague who is in clinical research and that colleague has a trial that you may be qualified to do. Would you like to go to this trial? It may help you. It could help the community. It could help the industry. But to do this trial, I can't work with you anymore as your doctor. I would have to refer you away to a stranger, to a different office, maybe even to a different town so that you could access these clinical trials. If you were in an autistic patient's point of view, could you tell me what unfavorable conditions or challenges in this clinical trial dynamic you might be experiencing? Absolutely. A few things stand out to me. And again, I think just for the sake of your listeners, I should mention that I'm not on the autism spectrum myself, but have definitely had some challenges in my life where I felt like I was kind of on the outside looking in. So I do sometimes come with a slightly different perspective. Just based on the question itself and the challenge or the aspect that you're going to have to change, or I would have to change doctors and change my routine, that is one of the biggest challenges for many people on the autism spectrum. Just keeping with that same routine, keeping in that black and white realm, because the gray area is very challenging for a lot of people. What will this new doctor be like? Will they listen to me? Will they understand? What will their office be like? How far away will it be? And will I be comfortable riding or traveling to their office? Not to mention, I know you and I have spoken a lot about different sensory integration challenges. What will the environment of the office be like as well? And then also, what will they ask me to do? Like, am I going to be made to be uncomfortable or kind of pulled outside of my comfort zone in some way? And then also, depending, I guess, on my age and what would be studied, who will be with me and what will my sports be like? That's only the beginning. If you could only imagine, I mean, this is clinical research, so we won't know what happens. That's kind of a tricky conversation to have with someone with autism is here's a clinical trial. This might work, but there's no guarantee because that's why we're doing a clinical trial. That would be a very difficult decision to have with a doctor you're familiar with, I would imagine, much less a stranger. Oh, absolutely. I think most people would agree that when they have a relationship with their doctor, regardless of what your challenges are, health, just even just general fitness, you start to have a comfortable dialogue with them. They understand you, you understand them, you understand the boundaries and what's fair game to discuss with certain people. And just blowing that up or stopping and restarting is very intimidating, I think, for anyone, let alone somebody who really wants and craves those routines to make sure things are a little bit more predictable in their life. We know the challenges. How might we be able to resolve these operational barriers to help these clinical trials become more autism friendly? You know, this is a really, really interesting topic because I've never thought of that doctor-patient relationship in this way of what happens if you're leaving one and going to another and how do you keep some continuity there? I think of this a little bit from the classroom perspective because I've worked in schools for so long and that our students many times at the end of the year, their year ends and then they're expected to go to another classroom, completely different environment, maybe even a different school. But what we do pretty well in schools, or at least try to do, is to make sure we have that continuity by having the teachers pass on as much information, strengths and challenges to the next staff so that there is as much continuity as possible. And then we also try to highlight if we do have some staff that are in both locations, which I know is not going to be realistic for a trial. But I wonder if even a summary of even just some of the relationship perspective, if that's possible, or how somebody most effectively interacts with the patient. Because just starting over each time, I fear that a lot of times when you're trying to measure something in a study, you may be actually getting all kinds of anxiety measurements, if you will, or hits instead of what you might be trying to actually measure. That's a very good point that I didn't even consider is if you were to increase the comfort levels in clinical research, 
research, you were to have more of an authentic baseline based off of how the participant was feeling at the time of the trial, that might even influence the trial's results. And that makes a lot of sense because one thing that I've learned over the years, and there's been studies done about this, it is very difficult to achieve valid standard scores in testing for people on the autism spectrum because so many times they understand way, way more than they can communicate to you, whether it be verbally or through writing. And unless you're really approaching a test visually, a lot of times you're getting some of those deficit areas instead of what you're really trying to measure. You may have just touched on something there. One of the big keys in clinical research is, of course, informed consent. It's very important. It's one of our staples in this industry is we want to make sure that our patients are fully informed of what they would be going through during the trial. And we want to make sure that after they are fully informed, they provide adequate consent at all times, complete transparent communication. If things change, they still have the opportunity to leave. They can leave at any time. You just mentioned visual cues. Do you think that informed consent could somehow be utilized in a visual pattern to make sure that we can adjust this for our autistic participants? Absolutely, because as every individual on the planet has different strengths and challenges, so do every person on the autism spectrum. No two people are the same. So a lot of times I'll think of these strengths and challenges as different sliders on an equalizer. And for one person, you might be able to sit down and talk through the steps and the different aspects of the study that they'll be involved with. And another person might have such a challenge with the auditory processing aspect that really only visuals might be able to be the best way to communicate the different phases and to give them some of that predictability. In schools, we use something called social stories. A lot of times in schools to give a predictable visual, almost timeline of what you might expect moving forward. And I think sometimes the the challenge is to really understand where people are at, because you could sometimes intimidate somebody or make them feel uncomfortable if you're assuming that they can't understand what you're saying. It's always a tough thing to gauge exactly where to meet the person at to make sure that you're providing enough assistance, but not going over the top as then to say, I'm assuming that you have this challenge. So therefore, I will show you these visuals. And I think that actually brought on another point. Going back to that physician relationship with autistic participants, sometimes I think that those physicians who have known and been through the journey with their autistic patients, they already have that established communication pattern where they understand what their patients need and their patients know how to communicate with them. Absolutely. And with one family, a doctor might be able to ask specific questions of the child or their client, and then they might know which questions they need to turn to the parent or guardian maybe to ask, just depending upon how how involved the question is, how many pieces or how complex it might be. And that's like a dance or just that kind of social piece that you're talking about that over time, we all learn with our doctors, but I think it's even more crucial for the autistic population just for, again, that overall comfort level. See it all the time at like the dentist or the barber shop. You're not going to get your hair cut or your teeth cleaned if you're not able to sit in the seat and trust the person who you're with for a few minutes. And that can take quite a bit of time. Yeah establish that trust. Almost like years of conditioning, trying Mm -hmm. to understand the relationship with the people that you're depending on. Right. I started Land of Lincoln Clinical Research. It's a site right here in Illinois dedicated to bringing industry level clinical trial opportunities to central Illinois. I have talked to way too many people who only have opportunities two to five hours away, sometimes nine hours away to access research. So Land of Lincoln has an opportunity to offer autism friendly clinical research. I'm working with national partners to try to create these environments for our autistic participants. One of the things that we are doing, we're working with a vendor to create a telehealth environment where the autistic patient could be an autistic trial participant simply by going to the doctor's office that they are familiar with. There's a a screen, a tablet kind of a device in their physician's office. They go on there on the other side of that tablet on that screen is the doctor who's running the trial. That doctor works directly with the autistic participants physician so that they can be part of the trial. It increases the comfort level for the autistic participant and it increases the engagement of their physician into their care through the trial and through that investigator. Wow, that to me, that is an absolute game changer because here I am thinking, 
thinking about the question you asked and if you had to go a further distance and to a different doctor and start over with a different office, even just a different secretary. And I know that sounds maybe a little over the top, but all these things really matter to these families because any little change of routine can set any of the clients off or just even make them uncomfortable to the point where they won't be able to participate in the best possible way. And if the end result that you're looking for is to find ways to improve the lives of this population, you definitely want the most valid results and the most comfortable testing environment possible. That is incredible. I have never heard of anyone attempting to do something like that. I really think that the future of clinical research should go back to the clinics. We need to create an environment so that we can integrate clinical trials into healthcare and therefore make uh, clinical trial access as easy as possible, not only for our artistic participants, but also for our contributing physicians who don't necessarily want to be investigators, but they still have the best interest for their patients. And if there are trials that are in the industry to help them, we want to be able to give them access to that as readily as possible. I think one of the other amazing things about that concept is if there is a blip or something that is an outlier, that doctor will know much better if a result might have been just something that is out of the norm for this patient or is something that might be actually relevant to the, through the testing. Even just on the best day, people on the autism spectrum might have a very tough time going to a doctor's office with the doctor that they trust. Mm-hmm. So testing, there's always going to be some challenges, I'm sure, making sure that patient is comfortable and that the results are valid. The doctor that knows the family or the patient the best will be able to pick up on anything that is more of an outlier than something that should really be measured. If we were to have this infrastructure in place that could substantially reduce these barriers of access to clinical trials to our autistic community, do you feel that our autistic patients would have a greater interest in participating in research? I really do. I think families would be much more comfortable knowing that they don't have to completely change their routine, drive five hours, you know what I mean, at different times. I I absolutely do. I think comfort is one of the keys when it comes to working with people on the autism spectrum. So I I mean, I would say that's kind of number one Mm -hmm. as far as people signing up for trials. I think obviously people want to be able to improve the lives of their children or of their family members or loved ones. So I think you're going to have people who are interested But yes, for somebody who like signs and says, yes, sign me up, I think it would definitely take that extra comfort. And I think that would be essential for families to agree. And from the autistic community that you have engaged with, do you find that there are certain comorbidities, certain things that they are suffering from that research could potentially help? Oh my gosh, so many. So there's many crossover symptoms with other diagnoses like ADHD, the attention and sometimes hyperactivity piece, depression, mental health issues issues are almost always present or at least have to be accounted for and really watched closely. Sometimes the higher the person is functioning, the more they have a potential for depression and anxiety, just understanding how different they are and how challenging their life is. But yeah, there are so many different comorbidities. Also, seizures for me is a very, very big one. A lot of people do not realize that there's a much higher incidence of seizure disorder with people living with autism and especially in teenage boys, not only does each seizure change the brain, but they can be extremely, extremely dangerous, not to mention impacting the function of the client or the patient. So yes, absolutely. And I could go on and on because there are ones with higher incidence. There are ones that might be a little bit lower, but could be dangerous. And there's just so many things to be on top of. I feel like the need is there. Our autistic community is hurting. And looking at a clinical research level where we have trials right now, now that we are working on just to try to help these populations, it feels like we should offer opportunities to the autistic population to be part of the trials. I completely agree. And I feel like a lot of times any parent or loved one, people look online or they do their own research for ways to help their child. And I do feel like a lot of times people are looking for these answers. And there's a lot of what I would call very loose studies or just minimal done before people put into practice practice certain types of techniques. And those can be dangerous to me because over the years, there have been some things that have been hot topics or ideas. And some of them have proven to be full on dangerous because they were not, in my opinion, uh, studied uh, properly.
regularly. Autism in particular, I believe, what, lithium? There's lithium treatment. Mm -hmm. Lithium treatment. There was chelation yep. was a big one many years ago, which was like a siphoning and filtering of the heavy metals out of blood, which unfortunately led to some actual deaths mm -hmm. can be a very dangerous procedure. You know, obviously people's safety and security is utmost importance. So wow. proper studies are crucial. Not only is the autistic community suffering from many things, but they have also been subject to certain practices in this environment that has been dangerous. And they are the recipients of the product of research where they're taking a lot of the medications that's developed through clinical trials, but we don't necessarily have the infrastructure needed to test the autistic population in clinical trials. I completely agree. And some of that kind of, I think, is due to, I wouldn't say laziness, but also just like a lack of creativity in some ways, because you do have to think outside the box sometimes in how you're going to collect the information mm -hmm. from the autistic population. I think, to be honest with you, people shy away from it. They get a little nervous about it and therefore just decide not to put trials and studies in place for this mm -hmm. population. It may take a level of understanding. How many clinical research sites do you know of that are certified autism friendly? Or they have some kind of a documentation that shows that they are working to create an autism friendly environment? None. I mean, I have never heard of anybody stated even in that way. I've heard, I would say in the last five years, I've heard more just community businesses and places speaking about autism friendly environments. Like for example, sometimes a skating rink or a movie theater will have an autism friendly event or sensory friendly event. But when it comes to the actual clinical piece, I have never heard that before. I can imagine some doctors and offices are trying to put some sensory components and different environmental things in place to make families and clients more comfortable, but not necessarily looking at every piece of what they're doing and making sure that each piece of that fits well into an autistic person's healthcare. Mm -hmm. Maybe the doctors that, of course, the autistic patients are familiar with, they may have the environment because they know what their patients need. They're definitely right there helping them. And even on the educators level, I know that in public schools, we have environments that are autism friendly because we know what our autistic children need to thrive in education. Oh, absolutely. Things have changed so much, thank goodness. And that it forces us in a great way to have to think about all the different environments in the school versus just one specific classroom that a student might be in. And maybe that's a way that we can adapt clinical trials is maybe we can learn some lessons from the educators. Oh, absolutely. There are some parallels between the education experience and going to your doctor. Obviously, you're going to get to know your teacher and that space much better because you're there pretty much every day. But without a doubt, just seeing how teacher can include a student and have some safe spaces or quiet spaces for that student or even just some fidgets. Sometimes it's just the littlest things. Those are the types of opportunities, I think, that could be really helpful for doctors to even just maybe observe a space sometime to see how a teacher sets up their environment. The multidisciplinary parallels are real. And I think that if we can talk to each other and learn from each other, we can really make the environment better for this population. I completely yeah. agree. And I think there's so many passionate people out there now. There's way more knowledge, which is great. There's always some disinformation or things that are just incorrect that are just thrown around social media. But there's so many passionate people now. And I think there's just a lot more caring and understanding. Society is ready to take some of these next steps. And it's just so exciting to hear what your business is doing to help make those steps and changes occur. John, if I were to give you the microphone and I were to ask you, how could we make clinical trials more autism friendly in our industry? What would you tell the audience? I think making the process as predictable as possible and also being as honest as possible to families. For example, if you know that you're working on a trial that is really just something brand new and might not immediately be the most effective technique, just being really honest up front with families because people's hopes are so high sometimes on quick results, but just really making the whole process for everyone as predictable as possible and as comfortable as possible by keeping as many components of that original relationship with the pediatrician or the healthcare providers in their life. So the least amount of changes I think would be the yeah. best. We have the technology now. It's very possible on a technology level that we could do this for our participants. It's just a matter of trying to get the logistics and all of the regulations behind it and even the adoption on the community 
community level so that we can make this a reality for our population. That's wonderful. I think that makes perfect sense. John, thank you so much for coming to CRP and Central. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for having me, Daniel, and for really trying to help this population and for trying to take as many different perspectives as possible, because I think that will definitely make for the most successful endeavor. I agree. Thank you, John. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Becky has actively worked in the autism community with her son, Jake, for over 20 years. She works hard to raise her children to be good contributing citizens and has even formed a company to help Jake make dog treats to help our society. Becky has enrolled Jake into clinical trials as far as nine hours drive away from her home. She supports research for the autistic population, but only if it is performed with as little anxiety and confusion for her son as possible. And sometimes the trials themselves that could help Jake in our industry do not accommodate his needs with legally authorized representative exclusions. Autism spectrum disorder is not the only consideration for this population. Additional comorbidities such as seizures, bipolar disorder, high blood pressure, and so many others are often present as well. Comfort and reduced anxiety are key. And although research at home may be the best option, Enrolling into trials in a familiar, comfortable, and understanding environment, whether it's a local physician's office or a centralized specialized location, would be the best possible scenario. John has worked in school settings with autistic students for over 20 years. He can see substantial hesitancy in the autism community to participate in clinical trials, particularly because of the uncomfortable and unknown environments that come from having to work with new people traveling to new places, being in unfamiliar environments, and changing critical routines. The doctor-patient relationship is important to everyone. However, it holds a particular relevance between an autistic patient, and participating in clinical research may be far more successful if we could collaborate with existing healthcare relationships to establish a dependable continuity of care, increase an autistic participant's comfort levels, and therefore reduce the anxiety of the unknown. Many comorbidities are correlated with autism spectrum disorder, including anxiety, attention deficit disorder, depression, and seizures. And if we create a comfortable clinical research infrastructure to support our autistic population, they would be more likely to participate and to contribute to the development of the same post-market therapies they depend on every day. Both interviews confirmed routine disruption and introduction of the unknown resulting from clinical trial participation significantly increases anxiety, confusion, and uncertainty in the autistic population. They also agreed routine and established relationships may be potential infrastructural solutions to accommodate the needs of a trial's autistic participants, and that if we were to resolve anxiety-inducing complications, autistic patients will likely be willing to participate in clinical trials. Finally, the additional comorbidities, from mental health and ADD to seizures and high blood pressure, are very real in our autistic population, and there are many patients out there who could benefit greatly from our industry's clinical trials if we could only create environments that accommodate. So how can we create an autism-friendly clinical research environment to better serve our autistic patient populations? Both of our interviewees agree it's comfort, routine, and familiar relationships. Be aware of an autistic participant's need for familiarity, of the unfamiliar triggers that could cause heightened anxiety, and be compassionate to the needs, the dependence even, of the relationships with trusted physicians that may have literally taken years to form. If we listen to the needs of our patients, we become more aware, and we exercise just some of the smallest little things, it could make all of the difference to increase the comfort levels, reduce anxiety, and provide an overall diverse, comprehensive, and understanding clinical research environment for the same patient populations who will depend on our therapy developments for generations to come. 
Thank you everyone for tuning into today's very special episode. Please know the struggles of our autism families are very real. And most importantly, if you are going through this journey, you are never alone. Thank you to Becky and John for participating and sharing their expertise with our audience. Thank you to our Community Voice volunteers, Rich and Jack Bolzer, for helping us with a very powerful introductory story. Finally, thank you to Medvector and Peterson Research Consulting for helping to make this podcast possible. If you feel just as strongly about autism advocacy as I do, and you'd like to support our efforts for community change, please consider donating to our $1 million for autism campaign. You can find more information at www.cuautismnetwork.org. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next time on CRPN Central.